Today, I'd like to introduce you to Joshua Green, who has co-authored a book with Gene Burgess titled YouTube, Online Video, and Participatory Culture. Uh, Josh is a postdoctoral research fellow in the Comparative Media Studies program at MIT, and he's the research manager of the Convergence Culture Consortium, which is a research project at MIT that provides strategic insight into the contemporary media landscape for a range of industry partners. Uh, Josh's work focuses on new forms of television and online video and participatory culture, and this book represents the first large-scale survey of YouTube's content structure and uses. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Josh Green. Thanks. G'day. So uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Joshua Green. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about YouTube, uh, and I suppose you know, sort of speak up, talk about the book that that a colleague and I um, uh, completed quite recently. Um, this is a collaboration between my research group uh, at MIT um, and uh, Gene Burgess, who is uh, a very old friend of mine who works out at QUT in, in, in Brisbane. Um, and this is an attempt uh, to sort of grapple with how we understand what YouTube is. Um, we both work in the field of media studies and, and, and cultural studies, um, and what we are intrigued about and what we were trying to understand with this project is how do we contextualise this new thing, this sort of blip on the landscape that seems significant? How do we make sense of YouTube when it itself is an incredibly complex object? How do we come to terms with what it's being used for and how do we locate it within the kind of discourses around the evolution of participation online, um, the future of media, um, and all of the other things that YouTube is wrapped up with. Uh, and so what we did with this book, and, and what I'll talk about today somewhat briefly, is you know, we sort of, we, we asked these very th three very simple questions. Um, what is YouTube? How do we make sense of it? Um, and what ultimately are the implications of YouTube? And of course, these things end up being um, kind of more complex. So the answers to these questions are more complex and the questions are not as simple as we thought they might be. Um, what we wanted to do with this project was to push together two methodologies. Um, we come from a media and cultural studies background, which traditionally is, is small scale, deep investigation, um, in, in rich interpretation of texts. When you're dealing with something like YouTube, there is a tendency um, to explore YouTube in order to uh, prove whatever it is that you might be interested in. So what we wanted to do was rather than look for particular types of content or particular types of uses on YouTube and then extrapolate out from there and say, therefore, YouTube is for political engagement or YouTube is for cat videos. Um, what we wanted to do was to instead try and get a sense of the scope of YouTube and then try and understand how the different bits of it work together um, and the sort of mix and range of content across it. Um, and this required a, a methodological innovation that I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, but sort of at the core of this uh, are two activities. One was an attempt to locate YouTube within the competing discourses that come to define it. So within the popular press, um, within the, the sort of the political experience, within the, the debate around, around uh, activism, around media culture, around advertising, around new modes of participation. And the other thing we did was draw together a sample of, of uh, north of 4,000 videos um, that were defined as most popular. And that's where we get to some of the politics of the work that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, looking at YouTube, YouTube presents us with an opportunity to confront some of participatory culture's most pressing problems. You know, looking at YouTube, we can engage with questions around the unevenness of participation and voice in this kind of democratized new age. We can look at the apparent tensions that emerge between commercial interests and, and public good. YouTube is simultaneously um, you know, a big commercial system and also it's, it's uh, a repository for, for our popular culture. Um, you know, we can look at, at the contestation of ethics and social norms that occurs as belief systems clash together. Um, you know, because YouTube supports that sort of stuff, the way the interests and cultural differences collide on a space that tries to support all of these diverse uses. Um, in later chapters, we focus on some of the norms um, uh, of the most important new debates around the creative industries, about new media, the new economy, uh, issues about user-led innovation, amateur production, questions of labor, um, and the apparent tensions between global connectedness and commercial monopolies. Um, and so... What I want to do is, is start by addressing, sort of locating YouTube and starting with the very simple question, which is where we started, and, and, and that is, what is YouTube? And this becomes an increasingly complex question because YouTube is not a singular thing. Um, 
My background is in is studying television. This is a quote from a, a guy working in the, in the UK called Stephen Heath. Um, and in 1990, he was writing a chapter in a book uh, where he tried to define what television is. And he goes through a range of different, of different ways to try and understand what television is before coming up with the ultimate conclusion that television is an unstable object. Um, depending upon how you look at it, television changes its constitution. Um, you know, and so what makes television an unstable object are the speed of its changes. If we think about the broadcast era, every day there is a new version of television reinvented for us. Um, it has this interminable flow of content. It's very difficult to stop television and look at it. Because if you stop it at any one minute, you're only looking at the television from that instance. And this becomes increasingly more complex when we look at television across national systems. And finally, Heath argues, it's the kind of quantitative everydayness. So the fact that television is this really simple domestic thing that is in our lounge rooms that we don't think about a lot, that makes it an unstable object, means it's, it's subject to all of these different definitions. You know, in a great respect, I think this comes to define YouTube as well. You know, we can think of YouTube as a, a thing but a fundamentally unstable thing. And so we know a few things about it. You know, it is um, massive. You know, the, 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 these are the, uh, are the recent figures. You know, it's, it's got a 40% market share, and, and of course YouTube is, ro is rolled into Google Sites um, when we look at, at Comscore metrics, but it has a 40% market share of video streams in the US. What's really significant is the next largest player, um, you know, uh, regularly, uh, commands only a 3.7% market share. When we look at it in terms of overall streams served, YouTube is quite clearly, or the Google sites, are quite clearly the thing that looks like Pac-Man. Um, you know, and even if, and, and there are all of these questions at the moment around um, the veracity and the reliability of, of video metrics, um, but you know, even if Hulu is making, gaining ground in terms of minutes served, YouTube and the Google sites simply outstrip everyone in terms of the sheer amount of content delivered. At the same time, YouTube is wrapped up in these discourses around what it means to participate in participatory culture. When Time decided that you were the person of the year, um, they chose to represent you as, as YouTube. You know, I mean, it's, ultimately they're not saying YouTube is the person of the year. I don't want to beat up on Time here. Um, you know, but, but the image you know, and the kind of iconic representation of you that Time gives us is the YouTube pain. You know, the prospect of broadcasting yourself comes to define or is a, a, an easy shorthand for what it means to participate in participatory culture. And this is particularly interesting when just sort of last week or the week before, um, you know, Time names YouTube as one of the 10 greatest uh, technological failures. Um, and so on the one hand, you know, it's representative or iconic of the potential of participatory culture. On the other hand, it can be you know, seen as a failure. YouTube is a, is a cultural archive. Um, you know, it's possible um, to, to, uh, to run out of nostalgic moments to watch on YouTube before you have even scraped the surface. So these are, and this is actually work of my co-author, these are three of her favourite moments. You know, and these are, these are kind of iconic moments in the history of Australia, or rather in her recollection um, of what it means to be, to be Australian. At the same time, it is this platform um, for an incredibly diverse range of activities, whether it's something like showing off, so just how well and how kick-ass are your skills um, uh, on the Guitar Hero, um, whether it's this instructional video, the one up on the left um, is uh, Depression Era Cooking, so it's someone interviewing their grandmother uh, who is talking about what it was like to grow up in the Depression, which is, of course, somewhat salient in the current economic climate. Um, you know, it supports these debates, and the atheist versus creationist debate, or the evolution versus creationist debate, is something that rages long and long on YouTube. Um, and it's also this space where you can run into beautiful things. And as Jean likes to say, you know, the last video on the bottom left-hand side is a love song um, about um, Mario. Um, from Mario Brothers. Um, you know, it's, and it's his pining love for, for Princess Peach, and it's one of the most beautiful things you will ever hear. Um, it's also this site for, for innovation. Well, what can I do? And this is a recent project that is one of my favorite uses of YouTube. That 16th note groove just straight. Going. It means, okay. Well, that's not very good. Do it again. Oh, 
All of these little public performances, you can use YouTube and play it as if it was itself a musical instrument. It is, uh, you know, it is, it is a meme factory. <laughs> you know, YouTube both helped us to understand, um, you know, the, the viral video and, and likewise has served a substantial number of those. Um, many of which, as in the case of Keyboard Cat and, um, and Taizan Day, in fact, probably, you know, all four of them, get reversioned and rearticulated as YouTube becomes a, is a generative space and people come to it in order to reuse the materials there in order to produce something else. Um, at the same time, YouTube is a platform for the distribution of professional content. Um, and if we look at, at the channels which are most viewed, you know, we see along the top row particularly a number of large, uh, what, what we refer to throughout the book as traditional media producers. Um, and we'll talk a little bit uh, later about the significance of, of, of music on, on YouTube. And this is something that the company itself is pursuing, you know, particularly within the US, and, and there are a range of politics around that. You know, but as the company looks you know, for that uh, efficient monetizable model, you know, it's increasingly presenting itself as a space that can serve in deft ways um, professional media producers. YouTube is wrapped up in discourses uh, of concern. Um, you know, the, the girl fight videos uh, struck a particular chord in the UK particularly, where YouTube was implicated in the creation of cyberbullying, in the destruction of, of classroom um, uh, behavior. YouTube is also implicated in the death of TV advertising. Um, when Wired wrote about the Lonely Girl 15 uh, experience, um, what I find so interesting about this cover is that right up the top, you know, they, they, right next to YouTube, they talk about the potential, uh, they implicated in the potential death of TV advertising, even though what we saw was a, 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 an experiment in participatory culture and online video by a bunch of filmmakers. But thinking about these things helps us think about how we are reinventing, you know, the broadcast media space. And the recent PRS debate um, uh, around licensing fees in the UK, you know, points to the way that perhaps YouTube is being implicated in the future of music as well. And so here we have this thing, and th these are only some of the ways that we can think about it. I think what's significant when we're trying to work out what YouTube is, is that we realize that YouTube itself was undetermined. When it was invented in 2005, it was launched with incredibly humble origins. You know, it was, it was a startup by three former PayPal employees um, you know, who were looking for an easy and free way to upload and, and publish videos to the web, which you know, at the time um, was something that hadn't quite been cracked yet. YouTube was one of, of a number of sites, many of which looked pretty much the same. Um, and there's a, an interesting TechCrunch article from 2005 that compares, at the time, the leading uh, online video sites under the mantle, under the header, sorry, which will be the Flickr for video. You know, so what it was that YouTube was trying to be was not quite, was not quite determined. Um, and I think this is apparent in the fact that, I mean, this is, a, is a, at the back there is a screenshot from the Wayback Machines version of YouTube's site from 2005. Um, perhaps it was about online dating. Perhaps that was the way, you know, that, that the site was going to make its money. It was about social networking. So sharing your videos, you know, affected or achieved a technological need. You could pass this content on to somebody else. But how are we going to make it pay? Well, maybe people will come to it so they can meet other people. And if we look um, uh, at the very, very first video that was ever uploaded to YouTube, I think we get a sense of both the uncertainness about um, about the medium itself when it was launched, but also the inherent ordinariness with which YouTube launched. All right, so here we are, one of the uh, elephants. Um, cool thing about these guys is, been, is that they have really, really, really long um, trunks, and that's, that's cool. And that's pretty much all there is to say. So that. That's me at the zoo, which is the first video, and I think uh, capitalizes, uh, crystallizes, draws together many of the ways, we, many of the things we think about that is, that is wonderful about YouTube. So the argument that we pursue in the book is that what YouTube has become now um, is a result of a process that Potts um, and others refer to as consumer co-creation. That ultimately YouTube is the thing that it is, not because of some kind of deaf design, but because it was a platform that was produced by um, uh, uh, the activities and the implications of a large range of ultimately consumers, participants within the space. 
Um, and so the site's value, what it has turned out to be for, has been co-created by YouTube Inc., which is now owned by Google, and the users who upload their content to the website, the audiences who engage around that content. And this group of contributors is incredibly diverse. Um, we have large media producers and rights owners. Um, you know, we have small to medium enterprises who are looking for cheap distribution or alternatives to broadcast channels. Um, we've got cultural institutions, we've got artists, we've got activists, we've got media literate fans, we've got non-professional and amateur media producers. You know, each of these participants, along with YouTube Inc., um, approach YouTube with their own purposes and their own aims. And collectively and collaboratively, or rather collectively, they shape YouTube as a dynamic cultural system. However imperfectly realized it may serve any of these groups. And many of these groups are substantially disappointed with YouTube along the way. Sometimes it's great, sometimes it fails them outright. You know, sometimes they can monetize their content, sometimes they can't. Sometimes they can engage with, their other, with other fans, sometimes they can't. Sometimes they get stuff pulled down and they don't understand why, and sometimes they don't. You know, sometimes it is this wonderful thing for all of these users, and sometimes it, it comes up short. And what I think is so interesting about this is that what YouTube has become um, has been a result of the participation of all of these users, even if they all don't realize that they're all participating um, in the space at the same time. I think they all treat it as if it's a space designed for them, or a space that has the potential for them to achieve their goals. But at the same time, it's supporting such a diverse range of users that what it can be can only be determined by the kind of pulling and stretching that comes from the relationship of all these groups. Which poses a problem then if we're trying to make sense of it. If we're trying to appreciate its size, its scale, its shape, um, uh, what it could be used for, what its potentials might be, what its ultimate value might be. You know, this diverse range of users and uses uh, is kind of a speed bump. Um, and so we perhaps foolishly thought we could solve this problem, or perhaps we could at least come about it. And we did so uh, soon after. We started this project um, soon after Viacom uh, launched its legal action against, against YouTube. Um, actually, this was incredibly motivating for us because Viacom's claim was, um, and you'll have to excuse me if I don't get the nuance of it right, but Viacom's claim was you know, that the most popular content that drives the value of the site is ultimately produced by large content producers. It's oriented around uh, the claim, I think, I think, speaks to where does the value come from and what is most valuable. And this claim struck us as strange um, because it, it seemed to approach YouTube in a particular way. And so to a certain extent, we wanted to test that. But really what we were looking to try and do was to understand how we can understand popularity on the site because that seems to be at the heart of, uh, of much legal action against YouTube. Um, and there are a lot of interesting ways to try and understand popularity, and there's a lot of very good work. Work like this that maps over time, um, say, user-generated videos and their, their life cycle, um, the number of views, how long between when they're uploaded, when do they peak, when do they start slipping into the tail. Um, and you know, this is, is a great, robust way to approach YouTube. It didn't satisfy us, however, because we're not entirely sure how an approach like this, you know, that runs bots on the site um, and that you know, uh, works principally with YouTube's metadata, can account for videos like this. I'm into nuggets, y'all. I'm into nuggets, y'all. I'm into nuggets, y'all. I'm into nuggets, y'all. Make nuggets, make nuggets, huh? Make nuggets, make nuggets, huh? Make nuggets, make nuggets, huh? Ketchup and mayo. Nuggets, ketchup and mayo. Nuggets, dip it in that barbecue sauce. Ketchup and mayo. What? Dip it in that barbecue sauce. Make nuggets, make nuggets, huh? Make nuggets, make nuggets, huh? Make nuggets, make nuggets, huh? Chicken McNuggets. Now, this is my favorite video on YouTube of all time. Um, and it's my favorite video because this is a video that I think we can see um, as a kind of coalescence of many of these issues. Right? This, this video that we just watched there uh, is ultimately an ad commercial for McDonald's. It runs at 30 seconds. Uh, it's screened on television. Um, it opens but with this, with this proclamation that what we're watching is actual user-generated content. And to a certain extent, we are. Right? The, the, the rap was uploaded to YouTube independent um, you know, of the McDonald's campaign. It was spotted by a trend spotter out here in New York who negotiated a relationship between these two fellows um, and, and McDonald's. McDonald's then you know, took it, cut in um, the, the title cards about how many McNuggets you could get for a dollar, um, and then uh, you know, put it on television. So at what point, and 
does this stop being user-generated content and become commercial content? Or at what point does this exist as commercial content and not user-generated content? Because it has a foot in both camps. And actually, McDonald's, the success of this or the value of this for McDonald's is that it is actual user-generated content. Now, this uh, uh, this copy is one of many that is floating around YouTube um, that were not uploaded by either of these two guys or McDonald's, but somebody took it off their DVR and put it up on the site. So it is circulated then by somebody who doesn't have an interest, near as I can tell, in either of these two camps, but thinks that this is an interesting bit of content. How do we come about and appraise this video? Um, from, its, uh, from its visuals, it appears to be both user-generated content and commercial material. It is uploaded by someone who appears to be what we might think of as an ordinary user of YouTube. So not a sock puppet for a, a, a large media company, let's say. So they're uploading it and sharing it because they think it's something interesting. It then circulates through channels on YouTube that may not be about you know, the promotion of commercial media, but might be about sharing interesting things with your friends. These were some of the questions that we were trying to sort of get at. And what we did then was, was take a sample of 4,320 of the most popular videos on YouTube and put together what we're calling a, a sort of a content survey. We appropriated some of the methodologies from the social sciences um, to, do a, to do a content analysis. We took a team of eight researchers. We wrote a coding book. We worked out how we could try and classify these videos. And then we looked at them all. Um, now, the sample is far too big to get the kind of coder agreement. Um, that the social sciences uh, uh, appreciates, but you know, ultimately what we're trying to do is see what happens and what are the tensions that emerge when you try and do a project like this. What I think is significant about it is that we drew the content from four of the different categories of popularity that YouTube offers. So YouTube itself, um, and this is an old screenshot, so I apologize if it's changed. YouTube itself offers a number of different ways to assess how popular something is. It can be on sheer reach numbers, so it can be about most viewed, but it can also be about some sort of engagement metric. Right? And, and, and already we have three or four different types of engagement metric boiled into this sample. Right? We have whether you've favored it, so whether you've decided that it uh, allows you to make a declarative statement about who you are, um, whether you've, you've, you've uh, linked to another video, so posted a video response, whether you've left a comment or whether you've merely viewed it. What we did was work across these four um, uh, types of popularity to try and see, well, when you don't just look at most viewed, what ends up being the most popular content? How is it used and by whom? Um, and so as I said, you know, we, we put together this, uh, this, this coding book, and this is a sample of it, and then we did all of this stuff, and, and these are some numbers. Um, but numbers are fine, but pie charts are funner. Um, so across our sample, we're looking, you know, uh, based on, on this sample in the coding book that, that we came up with, we're looking at something that looks roughly like a 50-50 spread, right? Um, half of the, roughly half of the content in our sample appeared to come from user-generated sources, or appeared to be user-generated, right? And, and I'll talk in a little bit about, about what those definitions mean. And roughly half of it um, in our sample appeared to be sort of traditional media. When we look at the uploaders, and what we did was split out the content from the uploader. So can we make a determination about who is uploading what? Can we make a determination about what is the type of content and who is putting it where? Well, predominantly, our sample is, our sample is dominated by what we refer to as, as users, by you know, what we think of when we think of people, ordinary people uploading content to YouTube. Now, as we, as we discuss in the book, actually making a determination about what counts as a user or not is a tricky and, and difficult thing, um, and I'll talk a little bit about it. When we look across the different categories of population, we get the pyramid shape, if you arrange the bars the right way. Um, and so we get this pyramid shape that says, you know, on the side of the sort of most favorited and most viewed videos, we see a predominance of content from traditional media sources. And this is in the sample that we put together. So then on the, you know, on the side of the most discussed and most responded, we tend to see a predominance um, of, of videos that appear to be user created. Um, and so if we look at traditional content, um, and I should, I should note that when we were doing this, it was primary season, um, and we were basing the study uh, out of Massachusetts, so we were located here within the US, um, and we did it at a time, we started it before the regionalization and completed it after the regionalization. So along the way, YouTube became a little fractured even for our sample. Um, you know, we see a lot of information and, and opinion content when we think about traditional media. And this makes sense if we think about what people are doing on YouTube. 
You know, YouTube, uh, to a great extent, follows the mainstream news agenda when we think about the traditional content that's being uploaded there. So, you know, it's a place where uh, you upload the last two minutes of the, of the football game because you want to be able to celebrate that moment. Um, midway through our sample, there was an earthquake in Peru. Um, and so all of a sudden, all of these videos about the, sort of the, the, the earthquake in Peru pop up. You know, as people try and share um, both material about what's happening, but also go to YouTube as a source of information. Now, there was a little bit, a, a small degree of the sorts of stuff that, uh, that the large media companies were concerned with. You know, the, uh, the uh, uploading of content as a way to get around uh, official distribution channels. But what we found that it was often lang uh, content that came from outside of the US um, or in languages other than English. Um, and ultimately, uh, I suspect that it, it's serving diasporic audiences. So audiences who don't really have access to this content within their region, but there is a, a language community, a viewing community, that might be transnational. You know, and this brings us to the Susan Boyle event, um, you know, which for anyone living outside of, of the US, um, or perhaps I should, I should be honest, for anyone living in Australia, um, you know, who grew up watching uh, a broadcast system that featured a lot of imported content, um, this idea of going somewhere because there's a ma going somewhere online because there's a major news event to which you know you don't have access to the content is a really ordinary way to try and keep up with the discussions that are going on. But the Susan Boyle thing points, I think, to the interrelationship when we're thinking about traditional content on YouTube between sort of the mainstream news agenda and the content flows. So Susan Boyle becomes an event partly because it's on YouTube, but it ends up on YouTube partly because it's a media event. And so the two are sort of linked together in a cycle. So we find traditional content used to mark tastes. Um, to, sorry, to perform tastes, to mark occasions, to catch up on events, and to comment on sort of what is the best bit. Um, and I'll talk a little briefly at the end about, about what that comment process. Um, you know, when we think about um, uh, the, the preponderance of music videos on YouTube, and also the, uh, in our sample, the large number of traditional con uh, the large amount of traditional content that appeared um, in the most favorited category, it makes a whole lot of sense. Sticking a, a music video uh, in your um, profile page is a key way in which we express some sort of identity. Um, music has long been linked uh, to the performance and the construction of identity across social networking. And so you know, that we see um, uh, UMG uh, and other music uh, labels appearing way up the top of the most viewed list on YouTube makes sense. Um, you know, it's part of what we do. If we look at user-created content, um, we see almost the flip side. You know, in our sample, the, the user created content was, was dominated by vlogging, that kind of what I think is probably emblematic of YouTube's form, the performance to camera. Um, but there is, of course, you know, a wonderful diversity um, when we look at user created content, from you know, the lip syncing girls in their bedroom um, through to performances uh, uh, like Tay's or those little bits of uh, 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 those little oddities like two otters holding hands. Um, you know, where we use YouTube to share these kind of and celebrate these trivial moments. But at the same time, we see these other um, uh, kind of performance art, or, sorry, art video art pieces. So the little Mario picture there is this, this YouTube thing that happens. It's called YouTube poop. Um, and what it's comprised of um, are a lot of rapid cuts um, of usually generally very bad uh, 1990s Saturday morning cartoons. Um, although they're starting to branch out now into episodes of Naruto and, and whatnot. Um, and it's put together in an in a, a almost nonsensical fashion. Um, the idea is to, is to juxtapose these little bits of content. Hopefully, if you're lucky, you can get it to sound like they're swearing. Um, but it is this incredibly large YouTube phenomenon. Um, and it doesn't make any sense outside of YouTube. Because what it represents, I think, is a, a demonstration of your technological prowess. You know, the same way that gameplay videos that we might see uploaded, you know, demonstrate how well you can jump a bike in Grand Theft Auto. Um, YouTube is a place where we see this kind of playfulness with the tools of media editing that are now, have been democratized. Um, and I think the other thing we see when we look at vlogging particularly is an incredible uh, reflexivity about the way that YouTube works and about the identity of being a YouTube vlogger. Um, and so this is a little video by, uh, I'll take a short segment of this, um, uh, by an Australian vlogger who vlogs under the name Community Channel. Um, and her vlogs are a mix between, um, well, her vlogs often comment on what's happening on YouTube itself and the identity of, of, of YouTube vloggers. So I want to ask you guys, do you get the same thing? Because I find what people ask me extremely odd. 
And for some reason, everywhere I go, it doesn't matter who they are, they have the same notions of what goes on on YouTube. Hey! Huh? So listen, David told me that you do YouTube videos. Oh, did he? That's so weird, right? What do you talk about? Just stop. Do you ever, you know? What? You know, do you ever, you know? No, what? Come on, you know, do you ever... What? You know. I just put it down. No, I don't. don't. She goes on to, uh, and the entire video goes for a good number of minutes, um, to uh, confront and, and uh, uh, I suppose, correct some of the perceptions about what it means to be a vlogger, about the motivations you know, for, for, uh, for all of these people to broadcast themselves. Um, and so I want to sort of start moving into the, sort of the, the wrap-up of all this, and I want to talk about what the implications are. Um, you know, of YouTube might be for the media space and also what are the challenges, and that's what I'll finish with, some of the challenges YouTube faces as it moves forward. Um, I really like binaries. I think binaries are, are a great way to think things through. Um, and when I think about YouTube, you know, it forces us to, to think about the blurring relationship between you know, professional production and, 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 and amateur production, between promotional uses of, of content or platforms and social uses um, between you know the the value of impressions um, and the value of, of expressions, which we still don't yet have an effective way to value, um, between the difference between being engaged with something and how we might measure engagement through the sorts of metrics that make the world go round, and what it means to participate. Uh, in a community, in a system, but also the relationships between distribution channels and making use of a platform like YouTube, you know, as if it was a distribution channel, and what the politics and potentials of platforms might be. YouTube has, I think, uh, um, a lumpy relationship, um, say, with the transition of television into the online space. Um, you know, this is Hulu, in case anyone didn't realise, and, you know, and this is ultimately um, the large big media's response to YouTube. I found it fascinating when Hulu was being put together, the discussion in the trade press was all about uh, putting together a YouTube killer. Um, and yet what Hulu does and what YouTube do are very, very different things. Um, an online distribution platform tuned for, say, a broadcast model is very, very different to what YouTube might be. Um, and I want to just take a minute to just quote Quincy Smith, who I think is, is, is one of the cleverest people in this space. This is a presentation from, from a little while ago now um, where he's talking about CBS's response to, to content appearing on YouTube. CBS channel on YouTube, who's putting clips up on Letterman all day long, he interviewed Paris Hilton a couple of weeks ago, and somebody named MangoFace94 ripped it off and uploaded the thing. And right when there were like 8,000 lawyers just primed at the pump to kill probably the number one fan in Letterman, thankfully, the media company got sight of mind clear to say, why don't we embrace it? If we can wrap around a safe, clean, well-led environment to monetize this thing, what's the difference between at Mango Face 94 and CBS as editors. The users have seen what they can do with it. So how, what are you going to tell the users they can't do it anymore? That's ridiculous. Media needs to be more comfortable with users as editors. Now, he says there are two very interesting things I just want to pick out for a second. Um, first of all, I both agree and disagree with Quincy Smith. I think he's one of the cleverest people in the space. Um, I think this little presentation, and this is an excerpt from an Ad Age video, is quite revealing. You know, he says, look, if we're going to deal with Mango Face 94, who might be the number one fan of Letterman, um, then maybe we should embrace it. Um, if we can wrap around a safe, clean, well-lit environment to monetize this thing, what's the difference between Mango Face 94 and CBS's editors? And the difference is that I'm not sure that Mango Face 94 cares about the existence of a safe, clean, well-lit, monetizable environment. Um, you know, and I think fundamentally that represents one of the challenges that YouTube faces going forward. Hulu is an attempt to create a safe, clean, well-lit environment that you can wrap stuff around and monitor, blah, blah, blah. I agree, however, that media needs to be more comfortable with users as editors. What that might mean, however, is a different orientation to the way we derive value from the space, to the way that we think about the ultimate purpose and value of this kind of online experience. Especially because, and uh, this is an article from Ad Age that, that is about six months after, after uh, uh, Quincy's presentation, um, uh, unofficial streams, unofficial uploads um, of Letterman's clips are still outranking the official streams from CBS. 
Um, you know, and part of that is because perhaps the fans um, know better about what the market wants. Um, and part of it, you know, might be because it's actually in CBS's favour to embrace these guys as, as editors and let it go. What I think this forces us to think about, however, is how we think about um, uploading content to YouTube, you know, what it means to participate. Um, you know, and I'd like to point out, of course, that not all uploading is illicit regardless of what the content is. But the reason I say this is because I don't think that all uploading is necessarily publishing. I think we need to move beyond a broadcast model, um, which is fundamentally oriented around distribution. A lot of the uploading of, say, traditional media content or even, you know, shots of a, a panda sneezing at the zoo to YouTube um, is an attempt to share something. But what it reveals to us, beyond you know, the fact that, wow, people like to share stuff, is what it means to be a media audience member. So audience ship has always happened behind closed doors. You know, the, 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 the great problem um, with the broadcast space is that you can't actually see people watching television. Right? It's something that they've done and is completed as soon as it's over. You can measure how many people turn the television set on, right? but even you know, most of the, the large-scale metrics that we have um, treat viewing as if it was a singular thing. If the set is on, then you must be watching it. What does watching it mean? Well, you're obviously sitting there looking at what's happening. Not you're doing the ironing, not you're going into the bathroom, not you're getting a cup of tea, not you're sitting there with the television on while you prepare your presentation or have a chat with your friend. What YouTube allows us to see, I think, is the experience of audience ship. Because if I upload two minutes of The Family Guy, I'm perhaps not trying to publish those two minutes of The Family Guy. Maybe what I'm doing is the participatory cultural equivalent of walking into the office and reenacting two minutes of The Family Guy, right? Axel Bruns, who works out at QUT, writes about, about the fact that audiences in the current age no longer need to rely on auxiliary media forms to speak back to the media system. So it used to be, if you were dissatisfied with something or if you loved something, you might write a letter to the editor of your newspaper. Right? And then perhaps you went on to the internets when the internets were invented and you might write a screed or participate in a discussion. Well, we're currently in a moment where if you're in love with something or you are dissatisfied with something, you can actually access that material itself. Media has become, audiovisual content has become tangible. Um, and so what we get is a, a situation where users can do the very things um, and, and produce content that not only looks like but is the very content to which they were responding. Well, perhaps we need to reevaluate um, what we think about when we think about what it means to be an audience member, what it means to be a publisher. I think the other thing we need to think about is that not all users on, on, on YouTube, especially, are necessarily amateurs. This is the Ford model site, although this is a bit of a dated slot uh, shot. Um, but Ford Models has a great, a great YouTube um, uh, channel. I really, really like it. A lot of the content is content you might see somewhere else, right? So if we had fa a fashion channel, a lot of the content is the sort of stuff we might see there. Um, yeah, but YouTube, uh, Ford Models puts it up. They own the rights to it. They also sell the distribution rights and the, and the rights elsewhere. We need to think of Ford Models as a user, the same way we think of the people in the room, um, you know, the casual users. And we need to break down, I think, the idea that you know, on one side of the fence is large media and on the other side of the fence is everybody else. Because in the YouTube world, on one side of the fence is YouTube Inc. On the other side of the fence is everybody else. And yes, you know, we have a diversity. We've got large media producers and small media producers. We've got good content and we've got bad content. Um, you know, but what we have is an incredibly diverse user pool. Um, and when we look at you know, uploaders across the popularity category in, in our sample, we see both a large number of, uh, and this is uh, the little numbers are the number of videos uploaded. So both a large number of large media producers who are actively using the site, but we also come across the sites like No Good TV. Now, No Good TV produces laddish style content. You know, it's the sort of stuff you might see on, on Spike. Um, they show up to interview Will Ferrell and they get their two and a half minutes like everybody else. But it's online distribution only, right? They are what otherwise we would have thought of as an independent media company, um, you know, independent producer. Something like YouTube forces us to reevaluate whether they represent the kind of traditional fold or whether they're more like, you know, the sort of casual users. And this is especially true when we think about the kind of entrepreneurial vloggers out there. So people like Marina Orlova, um, uh, uh, who does, um, and I can't pronounce it. So she does the, the, the definition origin of words. Um, and it's philolo no, philolo philology. 
I used to say it. Okay, so that's what that's what she does, and she is incredibly successful. But her mode is uh, is in, is inherently consistent with the way that vlogging works on YouTube. So she responds to her audiences. She responds to comments. She gives shout shout outs across the the vlogging community. She shows up in other people's videos, and she delivers her content. She produces uh, and she engages in a mode of production that might be akin to the sorts of stuff that we see with Oprah. You know, both of them produce a program that's oriented around conversation. And yet Oprah's YouTube channel um, is principally designed not to respond to the YouTube community, but to drive content, uh, to drive viewers back to television. And so I think not only do we need to think about not all users being amateurs, I think we need to think about not all vlogging or uploading so not, not all vlogging or user creative production being something that's A, monetized through, through commercials or, or, or ads, um, or B, something that's just people telling us what they think about stuff. Much of it is, is a business. Um, and if we look at the most subscribed uh, users over time, we see a distinction between the most viewed. So this was just from last night. If we look at, you know, at most viewed, you see large media companies. If we look at most subscribed, um, which you know, might be, um, say, loyal audiences, um, we see a larger number um, of these kind of entrepreneurial vloggers. Um, and so now we come to the sort of the, the, the concluding point. I want to take a minute to talk about the sort of uncertain futures that YouTube faces as it moves forward. Um, speaking at MIPCOM last year, um, Chad Hurley talked about YouTube being a site for empowerment. Um, you know, it, it empowers consumers of online video, it empowers advertisers, um, and it empowers content owners. Um, I think this discourse of empowerment is, uh, is apt and, and a fine you know, uh, description of the space. I think this discourse of, of empowerment and the users that it's trying to, those three stakeholders that it's trying to serve, um, stretches YouTube in ways that it's not entirely sure how to respond to and puts it in a really tough position. So looking at it, you know, the overall impression is of a company negotiating a range, especially once it, uh, once it internationalizes, um, a range of competing national regulatory structures and corporate demands, whilst at the same time ma maintaining a brand image that's based ultimately on sort of universal accessibility. And so tensions arise on YouTube around the need uh, to control which markets certain content can be accessed by, um, uh, or to navigate content regulation and censorship regimes of particular states. Uh, increasingly, it appears that these tensions are resolved through the selective use of content-specific geological uh, uh, geographical filters, um, but with no real responsi responsibility to disclose the details of or reasoning behind many of these decisions to users. Um, and users are uh, generally none the wiser when content suddenly isn't available in their region um, or you know, when, they, when they, they can't get YouTube altogether. Um, YouTube has a, a challenge as it tries to manage you know, the interests and, and, and provide for um, these large media producers whilst at the same time responding to the user base um, that ultimately its, its very livelihood rests on. And this is a user base that knows a lot about YouTube, but also sometimes seems uh, kept out in the dark um, from decisions that are made or the motivations that are made. And this user base includes, I think, large media producers and you know, the young people at home. So moving forward, um, YouTube needs to work out how to negotiate these tensions or they will tear it apart, especially you know, when we get um, estimations, as we had recently, about how much money YouTube is going to lose in the next, uh, the next four quarters. I think at the end of the day, we need to realize, however, that YouTube serves a fundamental and important cultural uh, 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 service. As much as it is a site that offers great opportunity for uh, uh, monetization and commercial value, it is also a site where much of the new cultural activity is being played out. I think YouTube has a responsibility to try and weigh up how it, it keeps itself alive and, and, uh, uh, and, and the services it provides you know, to commercial media users with its responsibility and I suppose some sort of perfect public service obligation, um, that it respect the fact that it is a site where people are rewriting popular culture. And I, I'm more than happy now to take questions because that's all that I've prepared. Um, so I'm sorry it ends with a bit of a thump, but such is the way. Thank you. Um, if people have questions, uh, we've asked that you use the mic. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, my name's Brendan. I, I sell advertising on YouTube. Excellent. <clears throat> and um, one thing that I often tell people about how to be successful on YouTube 
as a, you know, as a channel, as an individual, um, is to have been here about three years ago, or at least to have been on YouTube about three years ago. I mean, you look at that list of most subscribed channels, that's, <laughs> they all have been around for a while. Um, yeah. What would you say, what are other things that they have in common? So if somebody is starting up now, yeah. what, you know, whether they're a brand or an individual could yeah. propel them to the top? Yeah. So I, I think YouTube is a, is a great collection of fragments. Um, you know, and so I think you know, the, the, the first thing about success is having a clear sense of what success might mean on the, on the site. Um, I think sometimes people come to it and look for incredible reach. And what YouTube could be very good for is providing targeted reach and very, very good targeted reach. Um, in order for you to do that, but I think you need to understand who are the other big players um, in, your little, in your little niche. Um, and so, you know, I would always say the answer is probably to look to the key vloggers. Um, you know, they're the people who innovate in the space, but they're also the people who understand, I think, the way the space operates. Um, and when you look at what they do, often um, the most successful ones are participants in the space. So they're not just uploading content. You know, they're getting involved in debates that are going on. They're responsive to other videos. So it's not just about them broadcasting themselves. That act of broadcasting uh, is actually one that requires some kind of response to your audience. Um, and so it's not inherent. It's not uh, altogether conversational, um, but it's certainly not that broadcast yourself and the sort of let's just push it out. So yes, I agree. You know, get here three years ago. Um, you know, and grow and grow up in the space, or learn from the people who have grown up in the space. How do they respond to their communities? What's the language they use? What do they offer up? Um, there's a there was a, a a video a while ago that some people uploaded. That's a glitch from an EA sports game. Um, where Tiger Woods appears to walk on, on, on water. And, you know, some people uploaded it um, and it became incredibly popular and was at one point ranked as the 14th most viewed video within the video game community on, on YouTube. So the company that manages uh, EA sees this. They happen to have Tiger Woods lying around in a closet or something. They take him out, you know, and they shoot a spot with him apparently working, walking on water. Um, what they then do is grab the original video um, and edit the two together drop an overlay that says, look, you know, you thought it was just in the video game. Well, actually, it's not a glitch. Check it out. You know, here's Tiger Woods walking on water. You upload it to, you know, you upload it to YouTube um, as they did, and, you know, it goes up the charts for that, you know, video game community. Well, what that does was both acknowledge that the community is significant, producing content, you know, it's not just sitting there listening to what uh, is being pushed out. Um, it acknowledges the important people. So, you know, it took a video and, and actually said, this video is significant because you all like it. So we're going to do what you do. You know? We're, you know, we're going to use the resources at our disposal to sort of emulate the sorts of things that you're doing. So I think it's a good example of kind of a, you know, a corporate effort um, uh, that, um, you know, that responds to the sort of the cultural logics of the way the place operates. Hi. Hi. Um, so YouTube is such an evolving platform, and I'm sure in the months that you've been writing the book, you've seen a lot of the changes. We now have long-form content and new um, advertising formats with promoted videos and um, pre-roll and new homepage units. So what kind of challenges did that present you as you were writing the book? And also, what do you think the next book on YouTube might be about? Right. Um, so the challenges it posed to us... Um, well, the academic public, the, the book publishing cycle moves a lot slower than YouTube does. Um, uh, and, you know, I was kicking myself um, after we'd sent the book to the publisher um, when uh, agreements that we had referred to in the book fell apart between YouTube and certain corporate partners. You know, and so some of the challenges that, that we found in writing the book is that YouTube has a tendency to, to just change. So, you know, you'd wake up one morning, as I did, on think, I think it was the 6th of July last year, and all of a sudden there's all of these regions on YouTube, um, or maybe in the year before. Um, and, and, you know, when I went to bed, there was one YouTube. And when I woke up in the morning, you know, there were a whole bunch, and they just kept getting more, you know? And, that, you know, from, from a, all of a sudden, we had to confront the fact that YouTube is dealing with the politics of being transnational. Um, we hadn't anticipated that it was going to happen. You know, when we, we think we read most of the things that YouTube says it's going to do, we knew it was in the works. Um, you know, it's the same with a lot of the community management policies. Um, you know, that, that I think sometimes catch people by surprise because people aren't necessarily sure when the changes are going to happen. Um, and so for us, that, that was the greatest challenge. You know, that and the fact that many of the things that you say become irrelevant when or, or are fundamentally affected by, you know, YouTube opening up a, in the US and attempts to deliver long-form content, you know, or, or agreements are finally reached. Um, the next book about YouTube, I think, will address... 
needs to engage with the relationship between YouTube and the rest of the world. Um, uh, this is a book written by two Australians, one of whom happens to live in the US. Um, but you know, this is a book that uh, doesn't quite get to, partly because of the time we were writing. Um, the challenges that YouTube has as it becomes a, some sort of a global entity. So you know, local broadcasters are regulated uh, quite heavily in many regions of the world by uh, content uh, laws, by advertising laws, by regulation restrictions, uh, regulations and restrictions. Um, YouTube has to confront that as it works in different markets. It's a source of frustration to many people who don't understand why um, and who perhaps see YouTube as letting them down because this content isn't available in your region and the question is why. You know, because in Germany it may not be available for a range of reasons that, that have to do with, you know, with, with the, the way that the nation regulates its, its, its uh, media representations. Um, you know, uh, in other regions it may be because there isn't a licensing agreement. Um, and I think that is a particular source of conflict that is still being worked out um, and looms large uh, as YouTube moves forward. And can we have a copy of your presentation? Uh, yes, I'll talk to you about that later. <laughs> oh, and there are books over here if anyone would like some. Um, and I suppose I'll, I'll sign it if you'd like. Um, <laughs> yeah, on the table over here, Chris. And there are some in the library as well. Hi. Hi. So one thing that we often talk with our partners or advertisers um, about is understanding how to evaluate the collective of these um, comments or favorites mm -hmm. or whatnot. So I know that you took a look across like the top 4,000 that were, mm -hmm. that were um, like rising to the top. But did you ever look in any way about like at one specific video and or multiple specific videos and then attempt to like place, um, like ideally what I'd like to be able to do is place different um, metrics or mm -hmm. uh, values to those different mm -hmm. things and then have a way to, to, to monitor them instead of, instead of only being able to look at the most viewed lists. So did you all apply any sort of like code or algorithm to specific, um, specific you know, actions that happen against a video? No, um, because we looked at videos, in individual videos in depth. We okay. didn't develop any kind of code or algorithm to apply across the board. Um, we looked at in, some individual videos in depth and sort of uh, looked at their response and, and, and those sorts of things. I'd be happy after this or at some other point to, to talk yeah. to you about that because I, I have some ideas. They're just not altogether probably formed right enough to be sent out across the whole world. But, I, I, but I'd be happy to sit down because I, right. I do think it's possible to do. Okay. Um, and I think there are a number of, of canny ways that you can go about doing it. Cool. Let's talk about it. Thanks. No worries. All right, well, it's like uh, five, to 12, uh, 5 to 1 now, so um, maybe it's lunchtime. Thanks all for coming, um, and there are books, and I will sign them. <laughs>